Good morning. We're about to begin. Raise your hand if you're able to hear me clearly. All right, that's good enough. All right, for this week, we will be starting the trauma module. <clears throat> so it's going to be all trauma for majority of this week. The trauma module has nine chapters. All nine chapters will be a part of the exam. And we're going to start with chapter 24, Trauma Overview. And basically, this chapter introduces us to the concept of trauma and things that we need to consider as it relates to energy and how energy influence injuries. Let's get into it. All right, introduction. For people younger than age 44, traumatic injuries are the leading cause of death in the United States. And I will have a short presentation that looks more closely at Jamaica. Traumatic emergencies occur as a result of physical forces applied to the body. Medical emergencies occur from an illness or condition not caused by an outside force. Tra traumatic injuries may be caused by underlying medical conditions or medical illnesses may result from traumatic injuries. And we have looked at this concept before. So a medical problem can lead to a traumatic injury a traumatic injury can lead to a medical problem. Index of suspicion is your awareness and concern for potentially serious underlying and unseen injuries. We looked at the mechanism of injury when we were covering patient assessment. The mechanism of injury is what caused the injury to the patient. The index of suspicion is what you are anticipating based on the injury. So what is the worst case scenario that could occur for this patient based on the mechanism of injuries? That's the index of suspicion. Energy and trauma. Traumatic injury occurs when the body, body's tissues are exposed to more energy beyond their tolerance. Mechanism of injury is the way the traumatic injuries occur. It describes forces acting on the body that cause injury. So when force is applied to the body, body is able to tolerate or dissipate that force, then there is no injury. But if the force becomes concentrated and is not tolerated by the body, it results in soft tissue injuries. Now, there are some concepts for energy that you must be familiar with. So um, physics, Newton's law of motion, um, Newton's law of conservation of energy, and the equation or formula for, for force. So the law of motion states that an object will remain in motion until it is acted upon by an equal or opposite force. Right? So an object in motion will always remain in motion until it is acted upon by an equal or opposite force. So once the force in motion can overcome the opposite force, it will keep moving forward. But if there's an equal or opposing force, it's going to 
stop it. So that's the law of motion. The law for conservation of energy. The, we need to understand that energy cannot be created, nor can it be destroyed. And it constantly changes form. So we cannot create energy. We can destroy energy. It constantly changes form. Now, there are three concepts of energy. You have potential energy, kinetic energy, and the energy of work or mechanical energy. Potential energy. So everything on the earth has potential energy. And in EMS, think of it as the energy that an object possesses before a fall. That's what potential energy is. So if I have a pencil in my hand and I hold that, that pencil above my desk with my fingers, that's potential energy. If I release the pencil and it starts to move, then the potential energy is transformed into kinetic energy, which is energy in motion. When the pencil hits the desk and stop, that is the energy of work. Now, we need to understand this concept clearly. So again, potential energy is the energy that an object possesses before a fall. So we cannot create energy. It is always around us. If I am holding a pencil above my desk, my fingers, that is potential energy. If you're sitting in a chair, that's potential energy. If you have a cup with, with water on your desk, it has potential energy. If I release the pencil from my fingers, that energy is going to be transformed into kinetic energy, which is energy in motion. And it will be affected by mass and velocity of the object. So the potential energy becomes kinetic energy. When it hits the desk and come to a stop, that is the energy of work. So work is force acting over a distance. Forces that bend, pull, or compress tissues beyond their inherent limits result in work that causes injury. Now, kinetic energy is the energy of a moving object. And I mentioned to you previously that it has to do with mass and velocity. Mass is the weight of the object. Velocity is the speed in any direction. So velocity is speed in any direction. Now, what is important for you to grasp, you don't need to remember that Ke is half mass times velocity squared. Not going to be giving you any problems to work out. What you need to understand is that speed greatly influence force. So speed greatly influence force. It's not necessarily how heavy the object is, right? So the faster the object moves is the more force that is going to be generated. Potential energy is a product of mass, the force of gravity, which is the force pulling the object down, and height mostly associated with the energy of falling objects. Different MOIs produce many types of injuries. We have non-significant injuries, injury to an isolated body part, fall without loss of consciousness. So 
with your non-significant injuries, the mechanism is diffused, specific to an area of the body. <clears throat> with significant injuries, the mechanism becomes, hold on, let me back up. With non-significant injuries, it is specific, it's isolated to an area, specific area of the body. With diffuse mechanism or significant injuries, the potential for multiple trauma exists. So injury to more than one body system, that's multi-system trauma, that's a significant fall from heights. And usually if it's an adult, any fall three times the adult's height is considered significant. If it's a pediatric patient, it is two and a half times their height. Any fall in which the patient loses consciousness, so if the patient falls from a standing position and lose consciousness from that fall, it is significant. Motor vehicle and motorcycle crashes, cars, car versus pedestrian or bicycle, car always win, gunshot wounds, stabbings. Now, blunt and penetrating trauma. Blunt trauma is the result of force to the body that causes injury without penetrating the soft tissue. So the skin is still intact and the force is transferred below the skin, resulting in um, internal issues. Penetrating trauma causes injury by objects that pierce and penetrate the surface of the body. So there is an opening and there is also damage below the surface of the skin. Either type may occur from a variety of mechanisms of injuries. Now, blunt trauma results from an object making contact with the body. Motor vehicle crashes and falls are the most common MOIs. Be alert to skin discoloration and pain. Very important with your blunt trauma. Maintain a high index of suspicion for hidden injuries. You're thinking, what is the worst possible injury that can occur from this mechanism? All right, now let's look at vehicular crashes. Motor vehicle crashes are classified as frontal, rear end, lateral, rollovers, and rotational. And so there are five classifications. However, what you need to, to learn at this point is that regardless of the type of motor vehicle crash, there are three collisions. So there are three collisions that will occur within a motor vehicle crash, but you have five different classification for the type of vehicular crash. But within these five classification, there are three main collisions. And we are going to learn this now. So one, the first collision is the car hitting an object and coming to a stop. Object in motion will remain in motion until it is acted upon an equal, acted, acted upon by an equal or opposite force. So if a car is traveling at 120 miles an hour it, and it hits something and stop, it means whatever it hit had the same force to stop it. That's not good. Right, so there is an equal or opposing force that stopped that car. So that's the first collision. The car hits an object and comes to a stop. The second collision is the body of the patient. So the body of the patient hits the interior of the car. So if the car stops at one, 120 miles an hour, 
the body will continue to travel at 120 miles an hour and hit the interior of the car. That is the second collision. The third collision is the organs within the body will continue to travel at 120 miles an hour and the organs will come to a stop when it hits the interior of the body. So the third collision is when the organs hit the interior of the body and come to a stop. That's the three main collisions. Now there are other collisions which for this course, I don't need, need to really go into the details of those collisions, right? But there are other collisions. You can have secondary collisions from objects inside of the vehicle or people hitting people inside of the vehicle because they are not properly restrained. But what I want you to focus on and understand is the three main collisions. Now, do not swat the information. Do not try to swat this information. So do not swat that. The first one is where the car hits an object and stop. The second is when the, the body hits the interior of the car and stop. And the third is when the organs hit the interior of the body and come to a stop. Do not swat it. Understand what it means. So when I am thinking about the first collision, which is the car hitting an object and coming to a stop, I am thinking about access to my patient. So when I think about the first collision, I am thinking about access to the patient. And if I don't have access to the patient, which resources are necessary to create the access that I need? Because under no circumstances, we will pull a patient out of a car or vehicle if there is resistance. We never go against resistance. So if the patient is trapped, access needs to be created. So that's one. Two, my understanding of the second collision, which is the body hitting the interior of the car. When I look at the interior of the car and I'm thinking about the second collision, I am thinking about physical injuries, right? So I'm thinking about external injuries to my patient. When I look at the interior of the vehicle, if the dashboard is deformed, what part of the patient deformed the, the dashboard? If there is spider webbing in the windshield, what part of the patient caused that spider webbing? Right? If the lower portion of the, the steering is deformed, what part of the patient caused that? So I'm thinking about physical injuries, external injuries the patient that's a second collision the third collision is when the organs hit the interior of the body my understanding of the third collision is when i look at my patient in the vehicle i'm looking at impact points on the patient so i'm looking at impact points and when I identify these impact points, I am thinking now about internal damage. So the third collision, you're thinking about internal injuries to the patient. That's understanding. Now, with that concept explained, I'm going to ask a question to see how well your critical thinking is processing this information. There are five classifications of motor vehicle crashes. Which of these motor vehicle crashes will be, would be the most severe? So which of the five would be the most severe? Everybody can answer that question.
Go ahead, Mr. Brooks. Roll over, sir. Because um, whenever someone meets in an accident and they get rolled over by a vehicle, normally that person would have broken bones and all of that, sir. All right. So you're using you're using um what you normally see happen in a rollover to answer the question. I want you to use your understanding of the three collisions to answer the question and not necessarily the type of injuries that the patient have. So you need to use the concept of the three collisions. But I hear you. I hear your answer. I won't say if you're right or wrong. Anybody else? So I've seen some persons put frontal. Well, yes, Mr. Clarkson, go ahead. All right, yes, sir. All right, so I would um, say rollover. And my reason for choosing rollover is the fact that um, the three categories that you had um, explained, I don't remember the first one, but I heard the last two. And the second one would be um, the individual would, their body would bounce about in the internal portion of the vehicle until the vehicle stops, correct? For the second yeah. collision, the body hits the internal portion Interior of the car of the and yes, come to a stop. And come to a stop. And then the third yeah. one would be the organs um, hitting the inside Interior of the body, of the body. Correct. until the car comes to a stop. No, I would say this would be, rollover would be the worst one because, say for example, well, if the person is not properly restrained or even if they are properly restrained, the seat belts won't be strong enough to prevent them from moving about in the interior of the car and um, prevent their organs from hitting the inside of the body. So until the vehicle comes to a stop, they will be basically hitting around in the car and their organs will be moving around inside the body. So they can have external injuries and they can have um, internal injuries as well. For example, internal bleeding or puncture of an organ or whatever. I don't know if I explain myself clearly. All right, I hear you. There was someone else that had their, their hands up. Who was that? Go ahead, Mr. McKenzie. All right, so, sir, I would say frontal, you sir. Why? All right, so in a case where um, a MVA, right, for vehicle, it's an object. Most times it will come to a stop, and if you're not properly restrained in that vehicle, um, there's a possibility that when the car hit the object, the car will come to a stop then the body most times they leave the inter in, in the interior of the vehicle and the third one is when the organs will hit the interior of the body so that's that's my conclusion okay on why I frontal. so frontal mm. okay anybody else one more go ahead mr Doheny, one more. Can take more than one. Mr. Doheny, go ahead. All right. Good morning, sir. Um, Good morning. Um, I would say roll overs because with that, we can get the, um, it's like we can both get the mixture of frontal and um, rear, rear, rear end because, come on, the vehicle is rolling over so the internal organs are going to like shift around and the external impact of the, of the person can hit somewhere in the car break so i think roll over is is a lot more dangerous than any of the others in my opinion okay so noted noted all right so the question was 
of the the three the five classifications of motor vehicle crashes which would be the most severe the answer to the question would be rollovers and rotational crashes so the answer is rollovers and rotational crashes the reason is simple it comes back to the energy the laws of energy an object in motion will remain in motion until it is acted upon by an equal or opposite force energy cannot be created nor can it be destroyed it can only change form and force is mass times acceleration or times deceleration and most motor vehicle crashes will occur from deceleration forces a matter of fact is only one occurs from acceleration forces now with that understanding and the concept of the three collisions any motor vehicle crash that multiplies the three collisions will be severe so any motor vehicle crash that multiplies the three collision will be severe in a rollover and rotational the three collisions are being multiplied that is why they are more severe the second most severe would be lateral so lateral would be the more the second most severe um, motor vehicle crash because there's nothing to reduce the force if it's a frontal collision the front of the car will absorb that force and then the force is transferred to the patient if the car is hit laterally there is nothing much at the side of the car to reduce that force so lateral is also um, a serious motor vehicle crash but the rollovers and rotational multiply the three collisions all right let's move forward a crash consists of three collisions a car against another car three tree sorry or object by assessing the vehicle you can often determine the mechanism of injury Come on, slide. The second is the passenger against the interior of the car. So when you examine the interior, look at the dashboard, look at the steering. If it's the upper portion of the steering, the form is usually the chest. There's webbing in the windshield, the head cause that. Persons that are tall tend to go over the steering or dashboard persons that are small tend to go under the dashboard so common passenger injuries include low extremity fractures flail chest and head trauma and for the third collision this is where the organs hit the interior of the body and there can be uh, anterior impact and a posterior impact so passengers internal organs against solid structures of the body internal injuries may not be as obvious as external injuries but are often the most life-threatening Significant MOIs include the following findings. So death of an occupant in the vehicle, that's significant. Severe deformity of the vehicle or intrusion into the vehicle. Severe damage from the rear, crashes in which rotation is involved, ejection from the vehicle. 
and they can be partially ejected where the vehicle actually falls on them. They're halfway in, halfway out. Now, frontal crashes. Evaluate supplemental restraint system. Determine whether the passenger was restrained and whether their earbags deployed. If they were in their seat belts and the earbag deployed, this will reduce some of the force. Seat belts and earbags are effective in preventing a second collision inside the motor vehicle. Earbag bags decrease the severity of deceleration injuries and decrease injury to the chest, face, and head which I previously mentioned that majority of the motor vehicle crashes is from deceleration forces. So it's when the vehicle starts to suddenly decelerate. But there is one in which it's from acceleration. Despite earbags, suspect injuries to extremities resulting from second collision, we're thinking about second collision, we're thinking about external injuries to the patient. Internal organs resulting from third collision. If we're thinking about third collision, we're thinking about internal injuries. Children shorter than four feet nine should ride in the rear seat. If a pickup truck or a single seated vehicle, the earbag should be turned off. And if it's not disabled, your body should not be inside the vehicle when assess assessing the patient. Your hands can be inside, but not your body. Remember that if the earbag did not in, um, inflate during the accident, it may deploy during extrication. Remember that supplemental restraint systems can cause harm whether they are used properly or improperly. Yes, Mr. McKenzie, go ahead. I'm sorry about that, sir, it was an error. Okay. Still on frontal crashes, look for contact points between the patient and the vehicle as you perform a simple quick evaluation of the interior of the vehicle. All right, now rear end crashes, and this is the only crash in which the injury occurs from acceleration force. Known to cause whiplash type injuries, particularly in the absence of a headrest. As the body is propelled forward, the head and neck are left behind acceleration type injury to the brain is possible and they can get third collision of the brain within the skull and it can be the anterior and, and posterior point of the brain that is damaged call that cool contra cool that's french lateral crashes side impacts very common cause of death associated with motor vehicle crashes. And the issue with this type of impact is from when the car is hit at a lateral angle or laterally, it causes the body to shift away from the side of impact. So it starts to shift away from the side. And in that shifting, the aorta can be torn and that's going to be what kills these patients when they tear the aorta so they will literally bleed their entire blood volume out from that it's a large artery a vehicle struck from the side is usually struck above its center of gravity it begins to rock away from the side of impact and it results in the passenger sustaining a lateral whiplash injury. If substantial intrusion into the passenger compartment is present, suspect lateral chest and abdom abdomen injuries 
or abdominal injuries on the side of impact, and that can cause the aorta to tear. Possible fractures of the lower extremities, pelvis, and ribs can occur. Organ damage from third collision is possible. All right. For your rollover crashes, large trucks and sport utility vehicles are prone to rollovers. Injuries depend on whether the passenger was restrained. Most common life-threatening event is ejection or partial ejection from the passenger. Sorry, of the passenger from the vehicle. Spins, no, rotational. Spins are conceptually similar to rollovers. Rotation of the vehicle provides opportunity for the vehicle to strike objects such as utility poles. So just like the rollover, the rotational multiplies the third collisions, the three collisions, sorry. Car versus pedestrian. So car versus pedestrian, car always win. Injuries are often graphic and apparent, right? So these patients are not going to look like they're in good shape. And one of the things you should look at is the position that you find the patient in. And if you consider that position to be uncomfortable, right? Meaning if you were in that position and you would be uncomfortable, your patient is not in good shape. So if a, pa a, a person is hit by a, a motor car and they fall on the ground in a position that they're not comfortable in, they're going to try to move their body out of that position. If they have not moved their body from that position, they are not in good shape. They are in terrible shape. They have a terrible injury. You should determine the speed of the vehicle, whether the patient was thrown through the ear, whether the patient was struck and pulled under the vehicle. And I have a video to show you of someone that was actually, well, he ended up underneath the bus. Evaluate the vehicle that struck the patient for structural damage. ALS backup should be summoned for any patient who have sustained a significant MOI. Car versus bicycle. Car always win. Evaluate like you would for a car versus pedestrian collision. Evaluate the damage too and the position of the, bi the bicycle. If the patient was wearing a, a helmet, inspect it for damage. Presume that the patient has sustained an injury to the spinal column or spinal cord until proven otherwise at the hospital. Spinal stabilization or spinal motion restriction must be initiated and maintained during the encounter. Car versus motorcycle. Car always win. Protection is from helmet, leather, or abrasion resistant clothing and boots. And in Jamaica, you don't see a lot of that with persons that ride bikes. You're not seeing them in helmets and protective gear. And one of the, the areas where I would say have the highest death rate in terms of motor vehicle accidents in Jamaica is persons that crash on motorcycles. So there is a, that's the highest death rate, right? These persons tend to not do very well. Can it be contrib contributed to the speed? Can it be contributed to the lack of um, protective gear, can it be contributed to the availability of EMS response? I would say yes to all. Collisions usually occur against, a, against larger vehicles 
or stage stationary objects. When assessing the scene, look for deformity of the motorcycle, side of most damage, distance of skid in the road, deformity of stationary objects or other vehicles, extent and location of deformity in the helmet. Now, the different types of motorcycle crashes. You have your head-on crash, motorcycle strikes another object and stops its forward motion while the rider continues moving forward. This one can actually snap the femurs on both sides. So you can see bilateral femur fractures with head-on crash. Angular crash, motorcycle strikes an object at an angle so that the rider sustains direct crushing injuries to the lower extremity and they can be pinned, pinned down. And the crush injuries can become very um, life-threatening for the patient if the person is pinned down for four hours. Ejection. Rider will travel at high speed until stopped by a stationary object. An object in motion will remain in motion until it is acted upon by an equal or opposite force. So a rider will travel at high speed until stopped by a stationary object, another vehicle, or road drag. They can have severe abrasions, which in layman terms, an abrasion is what we would call a scrape. Control crash technique used to separate the rider from the body of the motorcycle. So there are persons who are trained to, to separate the, themselves from the bike when a crash is going to happen. Sometimes they are successful in separating themselves, sometimes they are not, and they are put, pinned and then dragged along the, the road surface. Right, so that's your motorcycle crashes. Falls now. Injury potential depends on the height from which the patient fell. Um, we will consider whether the patient hit any objects before reaching the ground or any other surface, right? So we are considering the distance, um, the type of surface that they landed on, and um, which part of the body made contact with that surface. Falls for your adult that is greater than three times their, their height is significant. Falls for your pediatric patient that is two and a half times their height is significant. Falls for any patient from a standing position in which they lose consciousness is significant. The pediatric, the younger pediatric population are, they are top heavy, their heads are big. So when they fall, it's head first the adult population will more try to break the fall. Whether or not that is successful depends on, again, distance that they fell from, the speed that they, they, they um, fall at, and the weight of their body. So patients who fall and land on their feet may have less severe internal injuries because the force is going to be reduced. It's not guaranteed that it will be less severe. They, their legs may absorb much of the energy of the fall and that force will be transferred up to other areas of the body. Take the following factors into account. The height of the fall, the type of surface struck, the part of the body that hit first, followed by the path of energy 
displacement. Where would that energy go based on where the force was applied to the body? Right, so that's your faults. All right, now let's look at penetrating trauma, which is the second leading cause of trauma death after blunt trauma. It can be accidental impalement, or it can be intentional by knife, ice pick, or other weapon. And usually your, your knives, ice pick, and things that pierce the, the, um, the skin. So the knife, ice pick is usually considered low energy, right? So low energy. And your, the handguns are considered medium energy and the rifle, and shotguns are considered high energy. Now we're not gonna get into the technicali technicalities of handguns that are high powered weapons. We're not having a gun class, right? We're trying to understand the concepts. So your knife and your eye speak would be low energy. The handguns would be considered medium and the shot shotgun and rifles would be considered high energy. Now, with low energy penetrations, injuries are caused by sharp edges of the object moving through, through the body. Knives may have been deliberately moved around internally. Uh, so that can happen. And it's actually the, the right way to stab someone. No, I'm not saying to you, you should go out there and stab people, right? But that's the right way to stop, stop someone if you're going to. So the blade enters the body and then it is either twisted or it is moved up and down and then pulled out. When that occurs, that wound that is created is going to be very difficult to close and it can cause severe um, external damage and ex, um, severe external bleeding for that particular individual. Um, persons that are facing their attackers, they tend to be stabbed in an up, in and upward motion. So it can enter the abdomen and go through the diaphragm. So they can have a abdominal injury and a chest injury at the same time. Persons that are running away from the attackers with their back turned, they tend to get stabbed in a downward motion, right? Doesn't mean that it will always be like that, but they tend to get stabbed. Somebody's mic is open. Mr. McKenzie. So persons who get stabbed in downward motion when they're running away from the attacker it can pierce the the apex of the lungs and it can cause lung collapse do you have a question mr anderson all right moving right along no for the handguns, the handguns would be considered medium energy. And the handguns, the, the, the nozzle of the, the handgun, it has uh, spirals inside of it, right? So it has spirals. And what happens is when they, the gun goes off, the bullet spins. So the spirals cause the, the bullet to spin when it exits the handgun. So when it fires, it spins. Now that spin is going to create, it's going to create a pressure wave around the bullet. So the spin creates a pressure wave around it. The pressure wave 
can cause damage inside the body and the actual path of the bullet can cause damage inside the body. So when it enters the, the body, the pressure wave around the bullet will cause structures to shift from their normal position and it can, it can have a lot of influence on hollow structures within the body. That pressure wave causing structures to shift is what we call temporary cavitation. So temporary cavitation is caused from the pressure wave. The actual path that the bullet takes or the destructive path of the bullet is called permanent cavitation. So you have temporary cavitation and you have permanent cavitation. Part of, the, part of the projectile may not be easy to predict. So it might not be easy to determine the path that the bullet take because it can ricochet, right? It can ricochet inside the body, can hit a bone, and the bone change the direction of the bullet. Part the projectile takes is its trajectory. Fragmentation will increase damage, and the bullet's speed is another factor. So the speed of the bullet greatly influences the damage that it creates inside the body. Cavitation results from rapid changes in tissue and fluid pressure that occur when the passage of sorry, with the passage of the projectile. So it's being created from the pressure wave, from that spinning motion, can result in serious injury to internal organs. The relationship between distance and severity of injury varies depending on the type of weapon involved. Ear resistance or drag slows the projectile. Area damage by a projectile is typically larger than the diameter of the projectile. So the entrance for the, the bullet is going to be smaller than the exit usually or typically. Energy available for a bullet to cause damage is more a function of the speed. So it's the velocity of the bullet and not necessarily the weight of the bullet that creates significant force. So the faster it is, the faster it travels, is the more force it will be able to generate. All right, now blast injuries most common in military conflict, but it can be seen in certain mines, shipyards, chemical plants, terrorist attacks, and um, in the States, meth labs. Now, uh, explosion occurs when a solid liquid or gas is rapidly heated and expands and it explodes. And when that occurs, you get what is called blast injuries and you can have four different phases for these blast injuries so you have the primary blast injury which the primary blast injury occurs from the pressure wave that is created from the explosion so that's the primary blast the secondary blast injuries is from debris, right? So injuries due to missile being propelled, shrapnel, or things that are thrown by the explosion that makes contact with the patient, that's secondary. Tertiary blast impact is injuries due to impact with another object. So the patient's body or the individual body is thrown against something that is tertiary blast the body being thrown against an object quaternary blast is collateral injuries so these are burns 
an area being crushed, toxic inhalation, building collapse. That's quaternary. Let me zoom back out. So blast injuries, primary blast injuries due entirely to the blast itself. Damage to the body occurs from the pressure wave. Secondary blast injuries, damage to the body results from being struck by flying debris or shrapnel. Tertiary blast injuries, victim is hurled by the force of the explosion against an object. And that can be magnified if the person is in a building and the bomb goes off inside that building. Quaternary or miscellaneous blast in burns from hot gases or fires started by the blast. Respiratory injury from in inhaling toxic gases, crush injury from collapse of the buildings. Most patients would ha will have some combination of the four types of injury. Organs that contain ear are most susceptible to pressure changes. So the ear can be affected by pressure, lung, and the gastrointestinal tract. The ear is most sensitive to blast injuries. And if pressure starts to affect the ear, it can also affect the individual's balance. Pulmonary blast injuries result from short range exposure to the detonation of the explosive, sorry, pulmonary blast injuries result from short range exposure to the detonation of the explosive. It can get an arterial ear embolism, and we know what an embolism is at this point. This can lead to disturbances in vision, changes in behavior, and state of consciousness, and a variety of other neurologic signs. Solid organs are relatively protected from shockwave injury. They may be injured by secondary missiles or hurled or a hurled body. Neurologic injuries and head trauma are the most common cause of death. Traumatic amputations are also common. Right. Multi-system trauma. This involves more than one body system. It can be a combination of head and spine, chest and abdomen. And in trauma, if you are going to suspect injury for a patient's chest, you should be suspecting injury for, for the abdomen. And if you're suspecting injury for the abdomen, you should um, suspect injuries to the chest. Chest is abdomen, abdomen is chest. Chest and multiple extremity trauma. So it's a combination of injuries. Alert medical control and transport rapidly. All right, now the golden principles of pre-hospital trauma care. Your main priority, your main priority is to ensure your safety, the safety of your crew, and then the safety of your patient. Determine the need for additional personnel or equipment. Evaluate the MOI. When you evaluate the MOI, what is your index of suspicion? Identify and manage life threats. Then focus on the patient's um, ABCs. And for trauma, look for excessive bleeding, Always look for that early before making contacts. As you approach a patient, do you see any signs of external bleeding occurring? That is present, you have to address that first. Then you do your ABCs. Shock therapy and your treatment for shock will center around um, providing supplemental oxygen or oxygen via positive pressure ventilation. Keep the patient warm, nothing by mouth, and 
if your protocol allows fluid resuscitation by IV access. If necessary, we need to perform spinal immobilization or spinal motion restriction. Transport immediately to the appropriate facility. We do not want to delay transport for these patients. So your goal is to cover your ABCs within the first six minutes. So you want to package this patient and get them ready for transport within less than 10 minutes. Time is what is going to save these patients. So if it's a serious traumatic injury, there's not much you can do in the field. They're going to need surgical interventions. The quicker they can get to that, the better. Definitive care requires surgical intervention. Unseen time should, not, should be limited to 10 minutes or less. In order for that to occur on a scene, you need an organized team approach. I did not state an organized individual approach. So it could be the best EMT or best paramedic God has ever put on the face of the earth. If you don't have a team that is effective, you can't do anything for the patient. So your team is important. How you delegate task and how well that team execute the task. And it's a team effort. So it's not me saying, okay, this is, is, is what I think needs to be done. This is what we are, this is what I think needs to happen, no, no. It should be, this is what we should be considering, no, right? We need to secure this earway. We may have to put on a tourniquet on this patient. We agree? All right. Um, Mr. Bonnet, jump on that for me, All right? So it's a team effort. Now, the, the more persons you have, in that team that are trained appropriately, the less time you will spend on the scene. But if you're working with persons that don't have the similar training, you're gonna have to do a lot of explaining and instructing, and then your patient loses time, which is very important. Obtain a sample history and complete a secondary assessment. That's not something that should be done on scene for your trauma patient if they are critical. So if you're gonna be collecting sample history, that should be done en route. If the patient is stable, fine, you can do it on the scene. Consider ALS intercept or ear medical transportation. Jamaica, the only place I know of that does Medivac is a JDF. And I, I'm not, I cannot speak to what are the guidelines in terms of requesting that type of um, response? I'm not aware, right? So I can't speak to that, but they do provide some type of medivac transport if necessary. All right, now the patient assessment. When a patient has experienced a significant MOI, it is and is in critical condition, rapidly perform a valve examination. When a patient has experienced a non-significant MOI, we focus on the area, the isolated area. We know this. These are things we know at this point. Well, some of you, some of you know. Injuries to the head, disability and unseen injury to the brain may occur. Bleeding or swelling inside the skull is often life-threatening. Include a frequent neurologic examination in your assessment. So we need to be um, up looking at the AV, PU, GCS, and pupil reactions, I would say every five minutes. Some patients will not have obvious signs or symptoms. Injuries to the neck and throat. Areas, area of serious or deadly injury. So it's a, not a nice area to, to have injured. 
they can develop airway problems. Look for your decap PTLS, IC in the neck region. Swelling may prevent blood flow to the brain. Penetrating injury, in theory, can result in an ear embolism. And I say in theory because there's no evidence to suggest that this has ever happened in the field. But in theory, they are saying it's possible. Crushing injury may cause the cartilages of the upper earway and larynx to fracture. So, and these are structures that do not spring back into position. So if something crushes the cartilages in the upper earway, it's not gonna spring back to its normal position. And the patient cannot breathe at that point. They will not be able to breathe properly. Injuries to the chest. The chest contains the heart, lungs, and large blood vessels. Many life-threatening injuries may occur, can have broken ribs, which can interfere with the process of breathing. The heart can be bruised, and large vessels may be torn. And one of the vessels that we worry about is the aorta. It's a high-pressure vessel, and it carries a lot of blood. A penetration or perforation of the integrity of the chest is called an open chest wound. If untreated, shock or death will result. Assess the chest region every five minutes. Assessment should include a DCAP, BTLS, IC, lung sounds, chest rise and fall. Very important. Injuries to the abdomen. The abdomen contains vital organs that require a very high amount of blood flow. So the organs in the abdomen are very vascular, the solid ones, so they can bleed significantly, right? The liver and the spleen in particularly. So solid organs include the liver, spleen, pancreas, and kidneys. And these are very vascular organs, so they can bleed a lot. Other organs include the stomach, large and small intestines, and the urinary bladder. These will spill their contents into the abdominal cavity, resulting in irrit irritation or inflammation. This is what we call peritonitis. Solid organs may tear, lacerate, or fracture. Hollow organs may rupture and leak toxic digestive chemicals. The rupture of large blood vessels can cause serious unseen bleeding. All right, now management, transport, and destination. Scene time. Survival of critically injured trauma patients is time dependent. Limit your unseen time to less than 10 minutes. To do that, you must have an efficient team working with. We cannot be working with persons who are going to be second guessing or not sure about what they should be doing. So your team need to be up to date with their qualifications. If you're in a system that you're not getting critical patients often, you need to do workshops every three months on skill areas that you're not commonly using. If this is not being done, when there is a serious emergency, there will be deficiencies. And it's easy for us to get complacent and comfortable. So you get into a routine, way of doing things, and you're, you forget that the possibility exists that you can get something outside of that. And we get so comfortable with the routine that we believe that we can handle anything until that patient presents itself. Then you start to panic and it shows in your assessment and management of the patient and it shows in your documentation. So we, ha we have to be ahead of the game, right? And as I said, you're in a system in which you're not getting frequent emergencies that are critical, then you should be having workshops 
every three months on skill areas that you are not using often, often and to test the effectiveness of your team response. It's going to be important to trauma patients and we are losing a significant amount of trauma patients in Jamaica, significant amount. Critically injured patients, dangerous MOI, you're looking for a patient with a decreased level of consciousness, any patient in which airway breathing and circulation is compromised. These are critical patients. Type of transport. You have ground EMS units, which are staffed by EMTs and paramedics. Ear EMS units or critical care transport is going to have critical care nurses or paramedics, or it will have critical care nurses and a doctor, an ER physician, depending on the type of um, service and location, because I believe in the UK they have doctors on their. Um, helicopter. Now, the AM, sorry, AAMS and Medivac Foundation International identified criteria for emergency ear medical services for trauma patients. The JDF would be the closest to that. And I, as I stated before, I don't know what are the parameters to request ear transport from the JDF. Extended period required to access or extricate a remote or trapped patient. Patient needs ALS care and no ALS level ground ambulance services available. Multiple trauma patients, mass casualty incidents. All right now, destination selection, and we have looked at a different type of trauma facility in the, the states already. And I mentioned that level one and two are quite similar in terms of the specialities that they have. The difference is a level one facility is a teaching hospital. Level three is a facility that has the specialized individuals, but they are not always present at facility. So if they are needed, they have to be called in. And then your level four can only provide ALS. Trauma centers are categorized as either an adult trauma center or a pediatric trauma center. Do not transport a pediatric patient to an adult trauma center when a pediatric trauma center is available. And you need to have a protocol for trauma response, a clear response protocol for trauma. Special considerations, remain calm. That's very easy to say, very difficult to do. It's something you will develop over time. So when I started out as a, a young EMT, I would always get nervous and jittery. As you experience the emergencies over the years, eventually you will get to the point where you can remain calm under any situation. And I am at that point, I believe, right now. The calls that I think would still get me nervous, I would say, is the pediatric. So when I have a pediatric patient, that gets me very nervous but I'm still able to, to function and do what is required. But outside of that, I think I can handle whatever comes my way. So it's something that will develop over time and it's important for you to have a good mentor. So you need to have persons that really know the work when you're coming in as a rookie to teach you the proper things and develop your skills and assessment. And that is very lacking in Jamaica. So we don't have good field training for persons going into organization because when you send the EMTs out 
even in the clinical rotation. They send them out in the clinical rotation and they come back. They pick up all of the bad habits, right? All of the bad habits. Shortcut, shortcuts for the blood pressure, shortcuts for the, the respiration and the pulse. Um, they don't have to, they were told that they don't have to do this assessment. It's not necessary. These are bad habits, terrible habits to have. It's never a good thing to shortcut your assessment, right? Because it does not take a long time to do a proper assessment. So why are you telling a, a young EMT that, no man, you don't need to do this. this. You can leave that out. You can use five seconds and check the, the pulse there. So we need proper field training for these young EMTs going into the field. They are the next generation. I believe the generation before cannot change. The ones that came before this generation, they are stuck in their bad habits. And it has become just a paycheck for them or it doesn't matter to them because their organization doesn't see them being up to date or current. Right, so you need a good mentor, very important. Complete an organized assessment, correct life threatening injuries, do no harm. Never hesitate to contact ALS, backup, or medical control for guidance. Right, you will develop a calm demeanor over time. Right, don't rush, but be meticulous. So you don't need to rush. You just need to be meticulous and sequential. If you're meticulous and sequential, you will be able to move quickly. If you're not meticulous and sequential, then you're going to be scatterbrained or rushing, but you're actually wasting, wasting time, right? So you will never see me grab, uh, you will never see me, grabbing a jump bag and run to anywhere. I'm not going to run to any patient, right? So I'm not going to pick up a jump bag and run go over to somebody and then I'm breathing heavy trying to catch my breath when I need to, to start an assessment. No. And I grab my jump bag and I'm going to walk to the patient in a timely manner, of course, right? So I can run with all of that equipment. It's not logical. And me running, I can trip and fall and injure myself. A person with a broken hand, the hand don't break, right? So the patient hand is already broken. If his leg has been amputated, it's already amputated. Don't freak out. You need to sequentially assess the patient and delegate tasks. So you must remain calm and you're working with the right person, that level of confidence will come over time. <clears throat> right, and that is the end of this chapter. All right, so before we go into the questions, are there any questions? <laughs> All right. Let me pause this.